Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Ben Rhodes, and Tommy is on vacation this week. Uh, so it's just me, but uh, on this episode, uh, I'm just going to go through some of the big developments that have taken place around the world the last few days, a lot in politics, uh, in Israeli politics with the collapse of the government there, uh, in the French elections and the Colombian elections, uh, the latest out of Ukraine. Uh, and then you will hear my interview, which I taped uh, during my trip, recent trip to, to Europe with Leonid Volkov. Uh, and this is a pretty well-timed interview. Uh, Leonid Volkov is Alexei Navalny's chief of staff um, and has been for a bunch of years uh, and now essentially runs or helps run uh, the Navalny political and media operation, which is largely in exile um, based in, in Vilnius. Uh, what you'll hear is how the opposition, uh, the Russian opposition, the Navalny operation has managed to prepare for Navalny's imprisonment, how they've been taking direction from Navalny within prison and communicate with them. Uh, although, uh, as you'll hear in a bit, that's uh, that's rapidly changing as we speak. Uh, how they've basically built a media operation. Um, they've always had a heavy media component, but what they're really focused on is getting news into Russia about the war. Uh, real news, which is hard to come by for Russians. Uh, and they've had some success here. They're reaching tens of millions of, of people, largely through their YouTube channel. You'll hear about some of the impediments that they face uh, in doing that um, as uh, Google and YouTube uh, have uh, you know, imposed restrictions on what can be done. Unfortunately, some of those restrictions have caught up the Navalny operation. Uh, so you'll hear a bit about that, um, a bit about how they look at the future of Russia, the vulnerability of Putin, uh, what Russian political opinion might actually be, um, a bit of skepticism uh, from Volkov about these polls that constantly show sky high support for Putin and sky high support uh, for the, the war in Ukraine. Um, that always kind of made sense to me if I was a Russian and somebody called me up and, and polled me and said, you know, what do you think about Putin? I might feel a little uncomfortable saying I, I didn't support him. Um, but this is a great window into Alexei Navalny, into the Russian opposition, an alternative view uh, an alternative Russian view on the war than we hear from the bombastic statements that come our way. So you'll definitely want to hear this interview. I was I was pretty fascinated by it to sit down and talk to this guy um, and hear firsthand uh, w what they're trying to do. And it's essential. I mean, we talk about the war in Ukraine and we obviously talk about the support for the Ukrainians. Ultimately, Russia is a country with 140 million people and a bunch of nuclear weapons. It's not going anywhere. And so uh, the only way that we get to a better place, ultimately, uh, in addition to obviously supporting Ukraine uh, in the immediate term, uh, is for there to be some change in Russia uh, in the longer term. Uh, and, and here you hear a voice um, that at least is, is fighting for, working for that change. So we're just going to start with some political news from three very different countries where we've had three very uh, dramatic developments uh, over the course of the last several days, each of which speaks to trends we've talked uh, about on Pod Save the World a lot. The first is in Israel, where we will have our fifth election in three years coming up. The Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, uh, after weeks of some political dysfunction in the country as the very tenuous coalition that has governed Israel uh, has been collapsing before our eyes, the Prime Minister Naftali Bennett announces that there will be another election later this year. And as a part of this move towards a new election, uh, he announced that his coalition partner, Yair Lapid, is going to take over as prime minister on an interim basis until that election. Now, what does this mean? Um, this means that we could be looking at the potential return uh, of Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, the former prime minister, uh, as the leader of a very right wing, very nationalist coalition. Uh, we could have the emergence of Lapid, who is the more moderate member of this coalition, uh, as someone who's not been able to quite get over the hump, uh, take his crack at it. Or you could have Naftali Bennett, uh, also a, a right wing nationalist, although one who's broken from Netanyahu. Uh, he, he will make his run for it too, most likely. So this is, once again, a very uncertain moment uh, in Israeli politics, uh, where the kind of deadlock that has been the norm in Israeli politics for the last few years will once again be handed over to Israeli voters to see which way they want to go. Um, interesting timing in a couple of ways. One is because Joe Biden is scheduled to go to Israel uh, in a few weeks as a part of the trip that will also take him to see non-friend of the pod, Mohammed bin Salman uh, in Saudi Arabia. 
Uh, so anytime an American president visits Israel, it's obviously a big deal. Visiting Israel in this kind of strange uh, political circumstance, uh, I think, makes the visit even more complicated. There have been reports that the U.S. government has asked Israelis uh, to not undertake particularly provocative actions, whether it relates to settlements, whether it relates to the Palestinians. Uh, but when you're in a time of political dysfunction in Israel without a very strong government, you never quite know what's going to happen on the ground. Uh, and so I think the context for that visit gets that much more complicated uh, as we look for a resolution, hopefully through the next election to this Israeli political crisis that does not lead to the return of Netanyahu. Uh, but that unfortunately cannot be ruled out. Um, and so, like many other countries, uh, Israel's political circumstances remain very fragile and very much in question. Now, getting to places that have had elections uh, in the last few days, the first was in France, where we've talked a lot about the parliamentary elections that were going to follow the presidential election. Now, just to, to rewind the tape here, uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, the pretty much centrist president of France, was reelected um, pretty comfortably over Marine Le Pen, the far-right leader. Um, however, these elections did not go the way that Macron wanted them to go. He did not win the kind of absolute outright majority that he had in his first term and that he would need to govern kind of with ease. Uh, he will be able to get a majority cobbled together with some other centrist parties, but he faces uh, a much bigger left-wing bloc uh, that performed pretty well in, in the election, but he also faces a much bigger far-right bloc than we've ever seen before. Uh, Marine Le Pen and her party uh, did better in this parliamentary election than they've ever done before. And, and so you're going to have something of a polarized legislature in France. You're going to have a president in Emmanuel Macron who's going to have to cut deals to get his domestic agenda through and to sustain support for his foreign policy. And I think importantly, something to watch here, Macron is term limited, so he has a five-year term. Uh, but these bigger questions about the future of French politics remain unresolved. You have a disturbingly large block of far-right voters and parliamentarians that will clearly be trying to gear up for that next election. You'll have a left that came together in a big tent coalition for the purposes of, of standing in this election. Uh, and we'll have to see whether that leads into some kind of rejuvenated French left that can reclaim the presidency. And you have Macron's kind of centrist political movement which is very much tied just to the person of Emmanuel Macron. And you have the question of whether that can lead into some kind of more durable political party uh, that is able to carry forward after Macron. Um, so like a lot of democracies, uh, France remains uh, a place with, albeit a strong president Macron, but a very uncertain uh, political future as well. And then the other election that we've been watching carefully was in Colombia. Uh, and in Colombia, you had a very dramatic development with the victory of Gustavo Petro, Colombia's first left-wing president in its history. Uh, I think this is really notable in a number of ways. Uh, the first is we've talked about several times. This continues a very substantial trend of left-wing leaders getting elected in Latin American democracies. We've seen it in Mexico. We've seen it in Peru. We've seen it in Argentina. We've seen it in Chile. Uh, now we see it in Colombia, which has usually been the kind of strongest right of center uh, country in the region. This is also a country in Colombia that has a very longstanding relationship with the United States, received billions of dollars uh, over the last decade or more from the United States to fight drug cartels, to try to eradicate drugs, uh, to continue the fight against the FARC, which was a left-wing guerrilla movement that turned into a political movement that reached a settlement with the government uh, in the Obama years. Um, so the question here going forward is, what is it going to mean for Latin America and for the United States to have this leftist government, not just in Colombia, but these leftist governments across the region? I think, you know, in a lot of ways, there's something hopeful about this. Uh, you have electorates that are really frustrated with inequality, which has been terrible in Latin America, uh, with political elites that are not responsive to the concerns of ordinary people. Uh, you have steps that need to be taken against climate change uh, in, in Latin America. Uh, so you have a, a left-wing agenda 
that I think could deliver a lot of results for people if real steps are taken, meaningful steps to combat inequality, if real steps are taken to make Latin America a key partner in the global effort against climate change. Uh, but you also have the challenge of meeting expectations. Can these leaders who are getting elected in places like Chile and Colombia really deliver uh, on what they've run on, uh, especially when they're faced with pretty endemic inequality and pretty sclerotic political elites that are pretty out of touch uh, with the people who are turning away from traditional political parties? Um, so this will be fascinating to watch, and it will be fascinating to watch what it means for this U.S.-Colombian relationship to have a left-wing leader like Petro in power in Colombia. I think it's also a sign of just how out of touch uh, America's Latin America policy can be from what the people in Latin America are actually looking for um, from their own leaders and from partnership with the United States. I, I think this is on display uh, in Florida, uh, which is kind of the the center of right wing American politics as it relates to Latin America, where Ron DeSantis gave some kind of rant uh, yesterday about uh, Marxist, communist, blah, 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 bad guys taking over in Colombia. Um, you know, Ron DeSantis, I don't think, has his finger on the pulse of what the Colombian people are looking for. Uh, he has his finger on the pulse of right wing politics in Florida. Unfortunately, right wing politics in Florida has been quite influential uh, in making America's Latin American policy over much of the last uh, couple decades. Um, so this is something else to watch, whether Colombia drifts away from its relationship with the United States or whether the United States in the Biden administration can have a more rational Latin America policy that is less rooted in these ideological debates of the past and more focused on, hey, what can we do together to fight inequality, to fight climate change, to support democracy, to combat corruption? Um, so all of this uh, bears watching, but pretty dramatic political developments in three really important and different countries, Israel, France, uh, and Colombia. And each of them really speaks to kind of what we've been talking about a lot on this podcast, which is the future of democracy itself, uh, the collapse of a lot of the traditional political parties that have held power uh, for much of the last several decades, and this question of whether the, the populist moment that we're living through, whether that manifests itself going forward on the left or on the right. So uh, a lot to keep track of going forward. Now, in Ukraine, uh, several updates on Ukraine before we get to our interview with Alexei Navalny's chief of staff. Um, the fighting on the ground in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine continues to be a grind. Uh, and you've seen Russia continue to make kind of incremental gains around some of the more strategically important cities in the region. Um, tough fighting on the ground, uh, but some of these towns that have been contested are falling more and more into the hands of the Russians, uh, as we talked about uh, in a couple of the previous shows. Um, I think what you see from the Ukrainians is a continued demand, really, uh, for more longer range artillery and heavier weapons that can allow them to beat back Russian advances in a way that they just haven't been able to uh, to date. I think there are also a, a bunch of interesting developments as it relates to both Russia's relationships uh, with other countries and America's uh, relationship, uh, such as it is with Russia. Um, first, kind of an interesting story. Uh, you had Russia issuing threats to Lithuania uh, the other day. Now, Lithuania is a Baltic member of NATO. So Lithuania does have that security guarantee. Uh, a Russian attack on Lithuania is an attack on NATO. That would bring the United States into the conflict. Now, why is this happening? Why is Russia threatening reprisal attacks against Lithuania? It's because there's a Russian enclave called Kaliningrad that does not attach to Russia territorially, right? It's on, on the other side of Lithuania. It's nestled between Lithuania and Poland. It's this kind of bizarre Soviet era relic where you had a city, Kaliningrad, that was somewhat repopulated by Russians um, in the post World War II Stalin years. Um, and Russia hung on to Kaliningrad on the back end of the Cold War. Now, what's happened is that in order to get supplies, like basic stuff, like concrete, the kinds of things that an enclave needs to survive and maintain its economy, a lot of that stuff flows through Ukraine on rail. And because of European Union sanctions, Lithuania is now saying they will not allow Russia to issue a lot of these shipments through Lithuanian territory. So the Russians have a problem. 
they can't get supplies to this enclave, this city, Kaliningrad, that's on the other side of Lithuania without going through Lithuanian railways. The Lithuanians are saying, you can't do that because of sanctions. And now you have Russia issuing threats to Lithuania that there's going to be some kind of response. The Lithuanians have pretty much taken this in stride. They've said that this is just more hyperbole from Russia. This is just bombast. They're not too worried about it. And they said pointedly they're not worried about it because they are a member of NATO. Um, but it does bear watching because one of the things that you always want to look for in this war is any potential tripwire that could escalate the conflict directly between NATO and Russia. This is one of those places where it could happen. Uh, although I tend to agree with the Lithuanians. We've seen the Russians threaten nuclear war over all kinds of things, including Finland and Sweden wanting to join NATO. This could just be more empty threats, empty bluster. Or we could see other kinds of Russian attacks on Lithuania. Cyber attacks, for instance, is something that they've used in the past against the Baltics. So something that bears watching. Uh, today, in a surprise visit, in Ukraine, the U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland has visited to offer support to some of the nascent efforts uh, to hold Russia accountable for war crimes. The U.S. Justice Department obviously has a lot of expertise that can be brought to bear in these investigations to gather evidence, to build cases. Um, so all in all, I think a useful visit and a sign that U.S.-Ukrainian cooperation extends far beyond just the military realm and the shipping of weapons. Uh, this is, is one other front uh, in the area of cooperation and, and one where I hope the United States can bring a lot of that uh, expertise and a lot of those resources to bear in building uh, what are very necessary efforts to hold Russia accountable for war crimes. At the same time, we've seen increasing reports about Americans who've been fighting in Ukraine. Now, Ukraine has a foreign legion that they've set up, and uh, reportedly there are thousands of people who are not Ukrainian who are now fighting as a part of the Ukrainian military. Um, and the U.S. State Department on Tuesday confirmed the death of an American citizen in Ukraine, and, and his obituary said that he died fighting in the war uh, in May. His name is Steven Sabielski. Uh, this guy was 52 years old uh, and presumably uh, was fighting uh, as a part of that uh, effort of foreigners going to Ukraine. We also have two Americans uh, who had been captured and who are in Russian custody and don't seem to be offered the same kinds of protections that combatants would normally be offered uh, in a war. Uh, the Kremlin's uh, spokesman went out uh, earlier this week and said that the two Americans who've been captured there will be, quote, held responsible for the crimes they have committed. Uh, and this suggests that the Kremlin might try to prosecute them as terrorists or as war criminals, uh, and that would deliver them a much, much harsher sentence than if they're just being held essentially as prisoners of war. Um, and we saw this happen earlier this month uh, when a couple of Britons and a Moroccan who had been fighting with the Ukrainian armed services were actually sentenced to death uh, in Russian-occupied territories. Um, we remain to be seen. Uh, 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 it remains to be seen what happens uh, uh, to these foreigners. But again, I think something to watch here is you have a lot of foreigners going to Ukraine to fight. Um, they obviously bring expertise and experience if they've been serving in the American military and the British military. The Ukrainians see this as both a sign of international support, but also pretty practical support uh, in that uh, they're getting uh, experienced soldiers uh, on the ground. However, it's going to set up potentially more and more of these types of cir circumstances where you could have American casualties, British casualties, uh, other uh, national casualties inside of Ukraine, or you could have more of these kind of standoff trials where the Russians use the threat of really harsh sentences, life sentences, death sentences, uh, to try to leverage or pressure or increase the cost for nations like the United States that are providing support for Ukraine. So this is something we have to watch. And I think the baseline point is that people who are fighting in this war should be treated as combatants. Uh, and that means that they should uh, have all the protections of the Geneva Conventions, the kinds of protections that suggest that you hold prisoners of war, uh, you hold them in appropriate conditions. Um, you certainly don't uh, sentence them in sham trials uh, in the way that the Russians are doing. So once again, the Russians are kind of throwing out the playbook, and that's going to uh, increase the danger to these individuals and obviously the 
despair potentially for their families, um, but also could become another, yet another source of geopolitical tension. Uh, one other area that bears watching, um, there are definitely signs that that Russian oil that has gone off the European market uh, and the American market because the US has an oil embargo on Russia and Europe is weaning itself off Russian oil. There are definitely signs that China and India uh, are making up some of the the losses that Russia has suffered uh, from sanctions. China's imports of Russian oil rose 28% in May from the previous month. That's a record high. Uh, and that means that Russia has actually overtaken Saudi Arabia as the largest supplier of oil to China. And this is one of the scenarios that we were watching when sanctions were announced. Was China going to essentially sit this out, buy the same amount of Russian oil that they always did? Or might they try to step in and one way they could help Russia out, certainly economically and in financing their war machine, is by buying more oil, maybe buying it at a discount rate. Uh, initial signs are that China is doing that uh, and that some of these other Asian countries like India that uh, rely somewhat on Russian oil are similarly ticking up uh, their purchases uh, of Russian energy. Um, so this is something that raises questions for the United States. One question is, will we not just apply diplomatic pressure on countries uh, like China, but will we start to sanction uh, people that we believe are seeking to skirt uh, the sanctions that have been put in place on Russia? Um, and this is going to be a big challenge going forward. And one of the things that we've talked about to tie all this together is that as the fighting becomes this grind in eastern Ukraine, as it stretches out week after week, month after month, as inflation continues to be a huge political challenge inside of the United States and inside of Europe, will the sanctions regime start to break down? Will the Russians start to find workarounds? Will they start to exploit some of those political vulnerabilities around inflation in the West? A lot of those scenarios seem to be taking shape here. And so even though Ukrainians have been able to fight off the worst of the Russian invasion around Kyiv, they've not necessarily been able to, to push back the Russian offensive in the east. They certainly haven't been able to go on offense uh, and take back significant amounts of territory from Russia. And there's now these other fronts in the war. There's the global food crisis. There's the holes potentially in the sanctions regime. Um, and, and there's the political vulnerabilities in maintaining that sanctions regime because of inflation. Uh, so I think thus far, the Biden administration has been quite firm and demonstrated a lot of resolve, uh, not just in imposing sanctions, but in holding NATO together and holding the sanctions regime together. Uh, as we enter this new phase, that's going to get more difficult, and it's probably going to require a sustained argument. And you don't hear much about Ukraine in the news, certainly to the same extent that you did a few months ago. In that environment, it's going to be more important, not less important, for not just people like President Zelensky of Ukraine, but for President Biden uh, and other uh, leaders of democracies to be out there uh, reminding their publics what this fight is worth, why it's important uh, to be plugging those holes in the sanctions regime, uh, and to be doing everything we can, uh, obviously, to at the same time hold open a doorway to potential negotiation to, to, to put an end to the fighting, but so long as the Russian assault is ongoing, to get Ukraine the support it needs uh, and to keep the pressure on Russia. So now, um, after the break, we'll hear my interview with Lena Volkov, who is Alexei Navalny's uh, pretty longtime chief of staff. Um, an interesting note, uh, I taped this interview with Leonid in Copenhagen uh, about a week ago. Um, since then, there's been some news about Navalny. Uh, he kind of went off the grid uh, after we got accustomed to hearing from him, uh, largely through social media. And you hear in the interview from Leonid how uh, Navalny was able to tweet and post Instagram messages and essentially offer direction to his political organization from prison. Um, well, that circumstance is no longer available to them. And you hear Leonid, by the way, in the interview talk about how they expect that. And they anticipated that Navalny was going to be moved to a much more isolated and severe uh, penal colony in Russia. Um, that has happened since this interview. And so Navalny kind of went off the grid for a couple of days. Uh, then it became known that he was moved to this more severe uh, penal colony. You heard from people in the Navalny operation express their concerns here. We heard from um, 
Navalny's family, um, saying, quote, this is one of the most dangerous and famous high security prisons in Russia, known for torturing and murdering the inmates. Uh, it is, of course, very concerning because he is one on one with the same people and the same government that tried to kill him in 2020. So this is a pretty dire warning from Navalny's family and his associates uh, that they're concerned for his his well-being, his safety and his life um, as he's been moved to this uh, more I guess in the U.S. parlance, it'd be more maximum security prisons, but uh, in Russia, it's a bit even more severe here. Um, and, and and at a minimum, one of the outcomes of this transfer is that he's not going to be able to have the same degree of communication with his lawyers, with his political operation, and with the outside world that he's had to date. Um, so yet another sign of, of Putin slamming the door um, on any voices of opposition from within Russia. Yet another challenge to Alexei Navalny, who's shown great courage. Uh, what you'll hear from Leonid, though, is that there is still a pretty substantial organization that Navalny's built that is active, that is in based in Vilnius in Lithuania, another reason why Lithuania might be in Russia's crosshairs, um, and, and that is trying to carry on the work that Navalny set in motion, uh, even if uh, we may not be able to hear from Navalny in the same way that we have to date. So stick around for the interview. It's really, really fascinating. I'm very pleased to be joined by Leonid Volkov, uh, who is the chief of staff for Alexei Navalny's political operation. And we're here in Copenhagen. Thanks so much for, for doing this. Thank you for the invitation. So um, let me just start by asking you, um, what is the con condition of Alexei Navalny right now? And, and how much are you able to be in, in contact with him? Well, he's imprisoned, which is a bad thing, <laughs> but otherwise he's strong. I mean, he's mentally, uh, morally, like absolutely fit. We are able to maintain contact to him through his attorneys who are allowed to visit him like on a regular basis. So they literally like print out the internet for him. So he is in touch with the reality, with the political reality, and he works a lot. So he's not only a symbol of the protest and resistance in Russia, but he also the acting head of our organization. So uh, he's not retired, he's not like just spending time there, but he's working and taking all the like strategical level decisions that define the operations of our political organization of the Russian opposition. And how is his, his health? I mean, obviously he had been poisoned. Uh, well, I mean... Uh the absence of bad news is our good news uh, in this regard. So uh, you don't want to get sick in Russian prison. It's it's a place where there is just no health care in place. So when he got sick, like last April, it, it, it was a huge crisis. So like really he had to go on a hunger strike to get medical treatment. Since that time, there was no other crisis. But if something happens, it will be a problem. And, and he's... I think scheduled to be moved to a more maximum security prison. He's been sentenced to an additional 15 years, is it? Uh, what, what are you anticipating there? Uh, to additional eight years. But uh, yeah. A eight, eight, eight years additional. Yeah. Okay. And, and then there are new charges, which yeah. might, uh, might add another 15 years. Yeah. But I mean, first of all, no one cares. He doesn't care. We don't care about this charges and about this prison terms because everyone knows his sentence was always meant to be life sentence. Yeah. But the question is, uh, whose life? His or Putin's? Yeah. <laughs> whatever, yeah. Yeah. What, 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 whatever expires first. And, uh, of course, while Putin is in Kremlin, he will not allow Alexei to be released. And when Putin is gone, then Alexei will be released, we believe, quite immediately. Now, uh, on the prison, that, that that's a funny thing about Russian law enforcement, you know. It's, <laughs> according to the law, yeah. He had to be moved to a maximum security prison a few weeks ago when his last sentence became effective. But it's Russian legal system. Yeah. For some reason, they don't do it. Maybe they didn't yet install all the cameras in the toilet and the new facility or something like that. Yeah, yeah, they're preparing <laughs> so, the new facility. Yeah, yeah so, so they, they keep him in his current facility completely illegally, yeah. but no one cares. Yeah. Well, actually, I have one more question about this because I, I was really struck... When I, I, I talked to him for my, my book, he was totally lacking in fear. I mean, well, you know, he said you are afraid when you're in prison, but he, the certainty that he had about what he was willing to do and sacrifice. I mean, you've known him for a while. I, I think people look at this and just can't imagine that you know, he would return to Russia from Germany after being poisoned and nearly killed. I mean, he's you know, a colleague of yours, presumably a friend. What do you want people to know about 
why he does this and, and how he does it. We work together since like 11 years and we are f- yeah, close friends. It is a question of perspective, actually. Like every time I'm doing an interview, uh, journalists would ask me like, why did he return? Yeah. And I will say, I mean, why do you ask this question? Yeah. Like, how how did he decide to return? There was never a decision point. There was never a situation when we were like, I don't know, sitting at a round table and yeah. discussing like pros and contras. Yeah. Even since he was in a coma, we knew he will return like quite immediately yeah. because he belongs there, because he is a Russian political leader, because he didn't do anything wrong. He's like a free man. And because of all the sacrifices he's already taken. That that's actually the point. So And his he, family supports yeah, him. Yeah, he he took enormous risks during like previous twelve years, like court, three trials in any court, multiple arrests, like hundreds of days in detention, like a chemical acid attack against him in twenty seventeen when he narrowly lost in sight on, on his right uh, eye. And then like and the assassination attempt, everything. Just to like stay abroad to become like political exile yeah. would be would kind of make all the sacrifice of the past kind of like almost obsolete. Yeah. yeah. And it was like clear for him and for everyone around him. So we never had this discussion on whether he had to return. Of yeah. course of course he had to, and he has full support of his family and of, of of the team. And of course we discussed a lot like how the roles will be distributed, how we should work when when he's imprisoned, like how the organization will operate and so yeah. on. And I believe I'm pretty sure he is well satisfied with how everything works he's there in prison but he's clearly clearly uh, the leader of russian position the perception of russian politics is very clearly like black and white for everyone who observes it it's like putin versus navalny and the organization is intact like despite all the pressure against us we were able to save it it operates and it operates on even larger scales than ever yeah, well, that's so I want to ask you about that. So obviously, the combination of him being in prison, but also obviously the war in Ukraine must have transformed your operations. Just we can get into the individual pieces of what you're doing. But how would you describe what the operation is doing now, where your focus is? Yeah, indeed. Like flexibility has always been the key to our survival in this very toxic environment. So our political organization did very different things during the last 10 years. We've been in electoral campaign when we were running like for mayor of Moscow or for president of Russia. Yeah. We've been a labor union when we organized like teachers and doctors uh, to unionize when, when, when we helped them. We've been a political party when we try to support our candidates in local regional elections. We've been, of course, a body of investigative journalism doing like anti-corruption investigation. And these are all, always the same people. So we are very like universal and flexible. So now, February 24th, we became the largest media operation in Russia. The, the largest Russian-speaking publishing house, so to say. Fun thing, uh, Putin gave us a head start, actually. So he forced us to move out of his country like last summer. Like in April, uh, they moved to announce as an extremist organization. In June, we have been awarded this designation of an extremist organization. So after this, no one of our employees could stay within Russia. So otherwise, they would face like up to 10 years of imprisonment. So we relocated all our staff to Vilnius and uh, elsewhere. And also many journalists asked me, do you regret? And my answer was always, I don't have time to regret uh, because we don't want to concentrate on the opportunities lost. We want to think about new opportunities. This yields us. And with our flexibility, we will be able to make use of these opportunities. Like when we were back in Moscow, we could never afford to run a wide-scale media operation because every third month, someone would come with a search warrant and would just seize all the equipment, uh, pretending this to be like material evidence for yet another criminal case. This happened to us like five or six times. It's like law enforcement raided our office in Moscow and took everything, like cameras, light equipment, com- laptops, phones, whatever, thing, whatever. So we always operated like with a very small basic set of equi- equipment. In Vilnius, we don't have these constraints, so we announced 
that last summer we will build a huge media operation. And our plan was to launch a huge political entertainment YouTube channel on March 1st, 2022, like to reach out to new audiences through entertainment, like literally to do like a cooking show, but to discuss like the enormously growing like food supplies prices during <laughs> the, yeah. during the cooking show. Yeah, yeah. Like, like to connect to new audiences, to engage more Russian people into like political debate. Yeah. So we had to launch it March 1st. Now Putin invades Ukraine. The war starts February 24th. But we already have. We have our studio. We have our equipment. We have everything. Okay. We start to do like anti-war uh, political television like from, from the very first day of the war. We, we started on February 24th and we continue through this three and a half months with political news news about the war, expert interviews, analysis, uh, counter-propaganda, like anti-fake and all kind of like dismantling criminals propaganda. And so on, so on. Like we started with two hours of broadcasting a day. Now we up to like six hours of broadcasting a day. And I believe we will get to like 24 hours by the end of this year. It's like a real independent political channel, which is the largest Russian independent media. We have a monthly reach of almost 20 million unique viewers which is like which is a huge operation and we did it. the same people who did like anti-corruption investigations and the same people who did like local electoral campaigns now are doing in media we, we hired a few professional journalists too but but still it's all such a like a makeshift operation but we believe it's like very important because putin not only started the war he also silences all the independent voices inside the country. But while we are broadcasting on YouTube, we are able to push our message through. We believe it's very important because it's very important to change the attitude of Russian society to this war. And do you, is that 20 million? How, many, how much of that do you think is within Russia? Almost all of that. Almost all of it, yeah. You know, we see in the West this insane set of conspiracy theories and disinformation on, on Russian state television and uh, online, we hear reports of, you know, 70, 80 percent of Russians support this war, or you hear anecdotes of people in Ukraine calling their family in Russia and the people telling them, oh, we're there to fight the Nazis. What's your sense of Russian opinion? Because clearly, you know, the, not everybody agrees with the Putin line. You know, not everybody necessarily agrees with your line either. How, how do you get, have any grip on, on how, how Russians are thinking? Well, uh, Russian public opinion is, of course, something that it's now very challenging to measure. So people just don't talk to the pollsters. So we have our in-house polling department within the Anti-Corruption Foundation. Since the Moscow mayoral election in 2013, we are always running the polls of our own because it's really important for our political operation to be aware of what's actually going on. And one fact that I can disclose that the response rate for the telephone interviews for the surveys that we were routinely conducting uh, was about 20% before the war, and it dropped to below 7% after the inception of the war. So people just don't talk to the polls. Is that fear? Is that Yeah, that, that, that's fear. They, 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 they feel fear. They feel stress. They don't want to confront the reality. They don't want to uh, tell the truth and so on. So I dismiss those like claims that like 85% of Russians support the war. We don't see any public support. Uh, they tried, for instance, to introduce this like letter Z yeah. as a symbol of the support of the war. It appears only on you know, like police cars and governmental institutions. People don't put it themselves like on, on their cars or uh, phone covers or, or whatever. So it, it didn't take off. People like don't like this uh, symbolic. And also, if we consider like for op opinion leaders, like despite all the repression and, and the risks, like much more like singers, artists, scientists raised their voice against the war rather than uh, supported the war. And also if we ask questions like indirectly, yeah. if we run our polling in a more sophisticated way, then we are able to, to get closer to the truth. The last poll we did, we asked a question, imagine oil prices are up. They are. Yeah. And there is additional income in Russian budget. So how would you spend it? Like, now, we don't ask them to spend their money. Like, in Ukraine, there is a 1.5% income tax for the support of the army since 
2014. Yeah. For eight years, Ukrainians are paying like additional 1.5% uh, of their income for their army. And actually, this is the outcome. Ukrainian army of 2022 Two is so much different of Ukrainian army of 2014. Yeah. So if you would ask Russian people if they want to spend like 1.5% of their income, everyone would say no. But we ask this question, there is additional income in the budget. How would you like to spend it? Now, we have Russian citizens who are, who are aware of the war and propaganda is telling them every day. We are not only fighting those Ukrainian Nazis, we are fighting the NATO. We have enormous enemies. This is a third world war. Uh, the Russian culture is under pressure. They are going to destroy everything dear to every Russian. Those like NATO, American-led gays and lesbians yeah. are going to, to destroy our unique Russian civilization. So this is what propaganda is telling them 24 by 7. So what, what's your guess? How many of Russian compatriots wanted to increase military spending? Um, there was a I'd guess like 40%. 6.8. 6.8. 6 Less than 7%. Yeah. Right. And it says a lot. Yeah. It says a lot. Yeah. So you can't ask the question, do you support the war or not? Yeah. Because uh, the person who's being asked knows perfectly that the Ron Cancer must yield 15 years in prison. Yeah. yeah. But if you really like try to ask the question in a, in a different way, yeah. the, the outcome is not that positive for Putin. Yeah. There is a core of hardline Putin supporters. Yeah. So there are people who think Putin is not doing enough. So we, we have to like just drop a nuclear bomb on yeah. Kyiv like to, they are less than 10% by, by, by all measurements. The majority of people, the vast majority, unfortunately, are representing this political swamp. People who don't follow politics, who don't follow the news, they are shocked by what is happening. They, they feel fear and they kind of like use the cliches suggested by propaganda as their self-protection. Yeah. A regular person can't say to themselves, that's my fault. That's my guilt. Yeah. That this, this, this happened because I didn't ever participate in an election because I didn't ever follow politics because I decided to not to participate in political life. So I have my income, my vacations in Turkey and my mortgage. So and let, let Putin handle everything. Yeah. Now, this is my fault that Russia has become like a full scale fascist state. Yeah. A regular person can't say it to themselves. It, it requires quite a level of reflection. Yeah. So not to get insane like to protect their integrity. Yeah. They borrow these propaganda cliches. We had to do it, otherwise they would attack first. Yeah. We have to do it like to protect our culture from those Nazis and so on. But these cliches, this is not a bulletproof vest. Yeah. This is like a crunch and creme brulee. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's just a very basic protection, just not to think too much about uh, what's actually happening. If we talk to them, if we, if we just try to knock through this Crust, and we are able to change their opinion. So how do you make people in that environment, especially when Putin's dominated so much of Russian politics for 20 years, how do you make them believe that things can change, you know? Well, first of all, even the most hardline Putin supporters have to admit he's probably not eternal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah but there's a way. It will end at some point. Uh, well, probably some of them believe he is not. Yeah. He invests enormously in longevity. Yeah. As you know, his elder daughter, she's an endocrinologist, yeah. and he has spent like billions on her institute where she effectively tries to develop a longevity pill. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but hopefully she will not be successful. And Putinism is a very personal story. It's a real autocracy. Yeah. It's a real autocracy. It can't be inherited. Putin doesn't have a successor. It's not a system. It's not like even the Soviet Union where you had a party infrastructure. Absolutely, absolutely. It's just Putin himself and his lieutenants, each of them, like, hating each other. Even, like, when Stalin died. Yeah. It took them three years yeah. to come up with a new leader. Like, first, Khrushchev, Malenkov, and Molotov killed Beria. Then Khrushchev and Molotov get rid of Molotov. And then Khrushchev managed to dispose of Malenkov. It took yeah. them three years. Yeah. So... Pretty much the same gonna happen when Putin is gone. Like he has like 15 or 20 like key lieutenants, none of them being strong enough to take over. And uh, this is on purpose. Putin doesn't allow any of them to get strong because otherwise he will be considered the lame duck the moment he appoints a successor. Putin has 
his own like support yeah legitimacy approval rating popularity but none of his lieutenants has yeah. and that's that's how the system works they need him yeah. because only he has he can serve as a superior arbiter to resolve their conflicts and so on because he has a mandate from the people he used to have yeah. a mandate from the people when he is gone the names of majority of his like key people are not known to general public yeah and none of them has any significant resource so there will be an enormous like fight of each other against each other yeah. which will present a perfect window of opportunities for us yeah like and we have invested like 10 years into building like horizontal structures grassroots movements training activists and so on we know we have millions of supporters in the country and we had an experience of like running protest rallies in 180 cities uh, simultaneously when there will be a window of opportunities, we will make the best possible use of it. I'm gonna take a different category. So we'll, we'll start with tech because you're in, in media and you're, you're, a lot of your platforms you mentioned involve like YouTube. A lot of the American tech companies you know, have kind of been pulling out of Russia. There's this difficult balance for tech companies. One is there's this movement for everybody to leave Russia, right? We're gonna get rid of McDonald's and everything. But then again, the only way that people can get actual information about the war in Russia is if they can go on a tech platform like YouTube and see it. What, what do you think American tech companies can do to support people getting that information um, while not wanting to be a, a vehicle for Putin's propaganda? Well, first of all, they have to talk to us. <laughs> they yeah, have yeah. to talk like not only to us, to all independent media, to civil society. They have to understand better. So uh, their previous strategy of just following like legal compliance and putting legal compliance ahead of human rights has clearly failed. Yeah. It is it is not a possible approach anymore. They have to think how to protect their users in countries like Russia or like China, Turkey or Iran. They have to think about what's best for to protect like human rights, like freedom of speech and so on. Like indeed, we are very dependent on tech platforms. Yeah, we operate mainly on YouTube. So the majority of our audience is on YouTube. And unfortunately, when the war started, like American tech giants did few mistakes, in my opinion, like severe mistakes. Like for instance, Google and Facebook switched off the option to run paid advertisement in Russia. They killed all monetization for Russian market. I, I believe they had a good intention, like not to let anyone earn money in Russia. But where did it lead us? Before the war, there were like four major platforms in Russia where you could do customer acquisition, like two domestic ones, like Yandex and VK, and then Google with YouTube and AdSense and Facebook with Instagram. Yes. And we did a lot of customer acquisition on Google and Facebook, while the government did customer acquisition everywhere. So they did spread their lies and disinformation and propaganda on all four platforms. So we were able to compete. We had two platforms, they had four. Now they are down to two but we are down to zero. Yeah. The government is still doing whatever they want with their disinformation on Yandex and VK, reaching pretty much every internet user in Russia. We don't have a tool to do customer acquisition exactly at the point of time when it's necessary. We talked about the political swamp, yeah. people who didn't follow the news. But the war, this is such a dramatic and life-changing experience that actually many of them, for the first time, wanted to watch something, to read something, to make their own opinion, to understand what's going on. This was the perfect moment of time where we could catch them, where we could engage them, start talking to them. And we were not able to do it because we just can't run this annoying pre-roll on YouTube anymore for whatever reason. And we are growing fast. But it's a c entirely or, or it's organic. People finding you. Yeah, it's, it's not you being able to promote yes. and find. Exactly. It's it's only organic growth. Yeah. Could be much faster. Yeah. And of course, this growth for us and other independent media organizations uh, on Russian language market, it's enormously important because it's one of the best possible tools to stop the war. The First World War, 1914, like Russia and Germany, uh, mothers and sisters and wives supporting their soldiers. You go, you fight for, for the God, for the Tsar, for, for the homeland. 1918, the same letters from home are, go, go back home, it's not your war, you don't belong there, you don't want to. Yeah. Bo both on Russian and German sides, and, and they, they just stopped fighting effectively. Yeah. 
army is part of society. The the morale of the army depends on morale of the society be, depends on attitude dramatically. So working with the public mood in Russia, we could affect the ability of, of Russian military to perform uh, any kind of operations. It's enormously important. And we were stripped of this opportunity by, by Google and Facebook in a clear case of collateral damage. Yeah, well, that hopefully we can that can evolve over time. You know, sanctions policy has been a key way that the U.S. has tried to stop the capacity to, to maintain the war. What is your assessment of, of U.S. and Western sanctions, and, and is there more you think that can be effective? Well, first of all, good that they are final, finally there. Uh, first of all, it's good they are finally there. Uh, we have been advocating for sanctions over assassination of Alexei Navalny, over other crimes of Russian government for a long time. And, well, if sanctions would have been adopted preemptively, yeah. this actually could have prevented the war, I believe. You think so? Yeah, I think so. Because one of the reasons Putin decided to invade, yeah, he miscalculated in many regards. He miscalculated attitude of Ukrainian people, strength of Ukrainian army, but also Western response. Because of the history of past eight years, he was sure there will be no response. Yeah. And actually, preemptive sanctions could have actually warned him. But, well, okay, the war has started, the West has responded strongly, but this has to be continued. There is one very easy test. Are sanctions enough or not? The war has stopped? No, then sanctions were not enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll teach you how to yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that, that is a good measure. Uh, yeah. Our next idea is this huge sanction list of 6,000 people, like the second tier uh, people that we identified in the Anti-Corruption Foundation. Uh, these are like upper-level management of, of Putin's system, like deputy ministers, deputy governors, key members of uh, like propaganda outlets, board members of state-owned companies, and so on, so on, so on, so on. Like people who endorsed the war, who made it possible, like real war enablers. Yeah. The most important fact about them is their average age is 45. This is the next generation. Like Putin's inner circle, they are Putin's age and they have like nothing to lose, nowhere to run. Uh, their hands are covered in blood. They, they, they know they were criminals and that's it. But to make the country run, to make the military run, to make uh, the propaganda operate, they employ a huge layer of like next generation hungry, agile managers. Yeah. Those managers have to be reminded that they will have a life after Putin yeah. because they're one generation younger. And now they can choose if this will be a life of war criminals yeah. wanted everywhere in the world or of people who made a very correct choice in the very last moment. So we are targeting them. We're doing it publicly. So not that we are talking, I, I don't know, like to European Commission, like uh, yeah, behind and, closed yeah, doors. Guys but we've this, published yeah. this list. We are promoting it yeah. in, in terms... In, in order to make these people scared, to, to make these people jump ship, because yeah. Putin's propaganda and military machine can't run without those people. And if many of them escape, if he manage to like induce a domino effect, this will undermine Putin's ability to continue the war dramatically. Well, one last question. I mean, what what is, it can look like such a dark time, and obviously it's darkest of all for, for the people of Ukraine. What sustains you? You clearly have a lot of energy. Do you have any uh, hope, or is it just a kind of sense of obligation? Like, what personally, what well, first, motivates you? Well, first of all, optimism is a job requirement. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, <laughs> and then yeah. You can't otherwise survive in Russian opposition. It yeah, yeah. uh, doesn't work the other way. But of course, of course, there is a lot of support from, from family and friends. Yeah. There is a lot of integrity. We know we're doing the right thing. We are on the right side of the history. Yeah. What we're doing is like morally, politically, historically, culturally right. We know that Russia belongs to Europe, that Russia deserves to be a decent European country, that Russian people deserve better. I live in Lithuania now, yeah. which shares the same history, which has been part of the communist empire for over 40 years, yeah. the houses look the same, yeah. the people look the same, the buses, the everything, like Vilnius looks pretty much the same as almost every Russian city of comparable size. Yeah. The same people and working a functioning democracy, competitive, uh, fair elections, free press, parliament, and so on and so on. 
it works. I know it works. Like for the same people, it's it's the most like Russophobic idea that it can't work in, the in world, Russia. That it can't work in Russia. Of course it can. And also the other thing is that Lithuania doesn't have oil and gas, yeah. yet the average salary is just twice higher than almost two, two and a half times higher than in Russia. Like because they don't have this enormous corruption burden, because they don't have Putin and his oligarchs and so on. Russians just deserve much better. And I clearly see how it's possible. And of course, the fact that we are also like one generation younger than Putin yeah. makes us sure that at the end of the day, we will prevail. Yeah. Well, uh, look, I, I really appreciate this chance to talk to you. People should watch the extraordinary documentary, Navalny, which we, we've talked about on this podcast before. How else can people kind of follow your work? Uh, follow us on social media. Uh, go to our website. We now finally doing also an English language website. It's acf.international, so Anti-Corruption Foundation. We have, by the way, our sanction list published there. We have a donate button there, <laughs> like we, we run on crowdfunding. And we see actually that some donations now arrive from our English-speaking audience. So we, we have a Russian-speaking version of our website and the English version of the website. So we know how many people click the donate button on which version. And we see that now, we after the documentary apparently there is a lot of support from people who don't speak russian but still want to support our work that's okay we publish there our news and new initiatives and of course you can subscribe to mine or alexis Navalny's social media where we also yeah. cover what's going what's going on in the country thank you for this enormous opportunity to be on your podcast great it was great talking to you